All right, thank you everybody for staying around. I appreciate that. I neglected to introduce a critical member of the Princeton Future Board, and that's Marvin Reed, who's here in the audience. <clears throat> Marvin Reed is a role model to me. Marvin Reed is a dedicated servant, public servant, civil servant, and person who cares about his community. Uh, Marvin is really one of the prime movers in this space that we're sitting in in Heinz Plaza here. And uh, Marvin's, if, if every politician in New Jersey had Marvin's attuned sensibility about public space and civic space, New Jersey would be the most beautiful state on the planet. Thank you, Kevin. I can always flatter the people that I admire. That's, that's the right you get at the podium. So for the, la for the next hour, I want to introduce four colleagues, and I'm more pleased to call them friends, people that uh, I've worked with. What's wonderful about the Princeton design community is that we have so many extremely skilled, talented designers, and we maintain a very collegial friendship. We team up and do projects together every once in a while. Um, we do public parks every once in a while. Uh, some of my colleagues have served on the board of Princeton Future. They volunteer their time to help the community. They do civic design. We're also lucky to work in this community because we have great clients. Our clients are highly educated and motivated to create special and unique spaces that bring them pleasure and reflect upon them the value that great design brings to their family life. So we're doubly lucky. We're lucky to work together. We're all lucky to work for you. I want to introduce Kirsten Thoft. Kirsten has a practice here in town. She works, I would say, primarily in residential design. She does some commercial projects. She's working on a project down in Ewing, or is it Hamilton. Trent? Hmm? Hamilton. Hamilton. Uh, restoration uh, and re adaptive reuse of a commercial building. Uh, but her, her daily work is actually working with this zoning ordinance in single-family, multi-family residential buildings in town. You probably know her house on Linden, uh, and uh, so she offers a perspective of somebody who works with this day in and day out. My friend Josh Zinder is to her right. Josh has worked in the community. He did his uh, internship and apprenticeship for a larger, very well-known, uh, internationally famous architect designer person here in town who's sadly no longer with us. Uh, now Josh has had his own practice for 10, 12 years, maybe? 13. 13, okay. And uh, Josh does a lot of commercial work, works uh, a lot in uh, adaptive reuse and commercial projects and interior design. Josh has done projects really all over the country, uh, in addition to working in Princeton. Uh, to his right is Marina Rubina. Um, I met Marina years ago, maybe, was it a lecture at? Princeton? Were you in that class with uh, Terry Smith? You just worked for Terry Smith. Okay. So Marina also worked for a firm here in town. She's had her own practice here for nine years. Nine years. Um, Marina works out of Tiger Labs uh, and her house on McLean Street. Uh, she's designed for it. I get the arc of history right. <laughs> It's the little details I trip on. <laughs> right across the street from the Waxwood. Um, Marina works both residential uh, and commercial work. Uh, she has done projects in Witherspoon Jackson neighborhoods, so she's very familiar. Marina is also highly attuned to policy and very interested in how community zoning ordinances. She was very involved in the discussions in Witherspoon Jackson when the historic preservation ordinance was introduced, and uh, she's, a, she's a thinker about these topics. Um, and Max Hayden, who I've already introduced uh, to her right, so the four of them 
are going to engage in a colloquy and discussion about zoning, and we will take questions from you uh, after they offer some opening remarks. So I'm going to actually ask Josh to start, uh, and then we'll move to his colleagues. Can everyone hear me? Enough. Very close. I guess I got to do Very close. How about that? Better? Okay. So uh, thank you for having me here today. Um, it's an honor to be on a panel with uh, such esteemed um, architects. And, um, and as uh, Kevin said, uh, you know, the architecture community in Princeton is, I think, uh, rather close. We're competitive, but at the same time, you know, uh, we enjoy each other's work and, uh, and on occasion like working together. So, um, you know, for, for myself, you know, I live on Wall Street, uh, I worked on my own house, uh, and uh, I guess, you know, about 18 years ago, a uh, number of variances, I've been through the process, uh, my house is right across the street from the high school, some of you may know it, and um, uh, I've also worked on other projects around town, so we worked on uh, Despagna, the restaurant here in town, Arlie's, Nomad Pizza in the shopping center. We did the uh, architecture for that. And, um, and I was really excited when I started to, when, when the town started to look at and position as the neighborhood character study uh, on the residential side. Because the one thing that I always observed is so many of our neighborhoods are completely miszoned. And, uh, and you know, when they started talking about form-based zoning and putting graphics behind it, it all made complete sense to me, and I was really excited by it. And one of the first things I asked at one of the public hearings was, does this mean we're going to rezone the neighborhoods to better fit the zoning? And, uh, and they basically indicated that, no, that was not the case. They were still going to use the same zoning they had uh, because it was far more convenient. Um, but they were going to tr try to apply this form-based zoning to it. and. Um, and I think at the core, the basic issue and the, the challenges that exist were ignored. And even though I was optimistic about it being a good start, um, I think that the path that the town has taken has really fallen quite short. And, um, and I think this could be illustrated in many neighborhoods, but I do think it's most uh, glaring with the Witherspoon Jackson neighborhood. Uh, and just as a point of reference, I'm currently working on uh, three properties in the Witherspoon Jackson neighborhood. So 30 McLean, the um, old Masonic uh, Lodge that's there, uh, it's finally started construction. And uh, 205 Witherspoon is another project that's under construction. Uh, and uh, a house on John Street that we're just starting. And, and the way I see what's going on with the zoning and the establishment of the historic district, <coughs> especially in this neighborhood, is that it's really hyper-focused on uh, preventing uh, basically the lowest end of the market in Princeton from improving their homes. And, and in a way, honestly, I really believe it's discriminatory. Um, I think that people aren't uh, looking at uh, the neighborhood as a neighborhood, and it's really setting up every property to do anything to require variances. And for as much as I don't want to ever talk myself out of a potential project or getting more money, um, I, I think that it's very expensive for people to go through a variance process. They have to hire architects, they have to hire lawyers, and um, even on recent um, issues we've had with the historic district where we just want to replace some vinyl windows on a project, and with new vinyl windows, now we're having to go through the historic process, and, uh, and clients don't expect that. And I think it's largely unreasonable. And, um, and I think that things like the uh, height to setback ratios, you know, when those type of things start to get applied to Witherspoon Jackson or the tree streets, you're gonna see so many more variances are needed. And I think that it's just hugely problematic. So that's my, my big picture. Thanks. Thank you, Josh. Hi. Can everyone hear me back there? Close. Close? Yeah. Oh, it's okay. Hi. Um, all right, so my name is Kirsten Thoft. Um, I'm an architect, and uh, I told my colleagues here that I would also say that I am, in fact, a builder. Um, I, I self-identify as a developer, and I am a landlord. So I think I may be here to draw fire away from other people. Um, 
but I can I can speak to the challenges of actually developing property in this town, which are huge. Um, the four bay zoning I actually welcome because I feel as though it levels the playing field for those of us who who care about design and pride ourselves on doing good design because it kind of reinforces things that those of us who actually have degrees in architecture and have practiced for many years feel are necessary to make good streetscapes and good neighborhoods. And so I think that it's a move in the right direction. Um, what I, I'm just gonna throw this out there, I keep hearing concerns uh, that, that say, we need to stop teardowns. And I'm just gonna address it head on. There are some buildings that are not worth renovating. And um, I, I've done lots of renovations. I've done renovations in historic districts. I do what I can to save buildings. But there are some buildings that just simply are not worth saving. And they have to do with uh, energy efficiency, which is a, a huge concern of mine. Um, toxic materials in buildings, poor construction, uh, when these things were originally put up right after World War II, where we had an enormous housing boom and uh, houses were put up quickly out of cheap materials and they weren't meant to last 70 years. And so here we are 70 years later and you know these things are not, frankly, worth spending $300,000 to renovate. Um, and it's not just for those of us who are builders and developers who are trying to turn them around and make, hopefully, a little bit of a profit for our work, for homeowners you know, and new buyers, they're not worth putting that money into. Um, so what I'm interested in more is less, you know, let's not tear things down, but what are we putting up in their place? Exactly. And I would hope that, you know, the form based zoning is a beginning, but I think that we can go further. I think that, um, you know, requiring uh, adherence to the building code, or the energy code, um, would be good. I do it. I'm not convinced that other builders do. Um, I think that, uh, you know, interest in um, walkability, sustainability of materials, affordability, none of that has been expressed in ordinances uh, and in zoning, and I would be delighted if more people in town would clamor for that and, you know, kind of give this ordinance a couple of years to see what it does in terms of the actual massing of the buildings and focus on these other issues. I'm an architect here in town, and apart from being an architect who spends a lot of time trying to figure out interesting, unique solutions to every problem, I also try to think about the big picture, and this is why I then can't help myself and write these letters to the editor, because, and I, you know, I just can't help it, because I think, you know, we got to have that bigger picture conversation, and I'm really glad that you came today, and we could have that conversation, or at least start. And then we could continue letting us, our elected officials, know what what it is that, you know, we want, right? And I think Kirsten started saying that before we sort of finalize these zonings, let's let's think about the bigger picture. Where are we going, right? What do we want to be when we grow up? I mean, I, I think of this every day. And, you know, my kids think I'm a grown-up, but really I'm not. Um, <laughs> so I think... What I would like to talk about is, in general, people don't have a clue what zoning does to their lives. You know, everybody goes around their business thinking like, oh, okay, great, wonderful, you know, tomorrow I have the baby, I'm going to put an addition on my house, and they call me, and I'm like, I'm really sorry to tell you, but you can't put an addition on your house because of the FAR, something they have never heard of. They have absolutely no idea. And then, oh, you know, classmates of my son, the parents replaced an air conditioning, 
unit and you know the, the mechanical contractor went to the town to get a permit and now they're stuck in this situation where we, they can't resolve it because their new air conditioning unit is bigger than the old one and they're over the FAR. It, it has a huge effect on people's <clears throat> lives and now they can't sell the house because they have an open permit, right? But people don't go about their life thinking about this stuff. So I think that it's really important and thank you for Prince of Future having this conversation. Let's start understanding how zoning impacts our lives because it does and it used to be. I had a very interesting client who many years ago said that zoning is a women's rights issue because it used to be why were women not allowed to work because they were not, you're not allowed to work from home because businesses were not allowed at home. Right, so your zoning controls crazy things in your life, right? And now we're controlled. You can't work from home. You now are allowed. It's allowed to have a home occupation. I'm allowed to be an architect from home. But if I choose to have an employee, that's not allowed because they don't have anywhere to park. Right? Did anybody know that? Right? So there are all these things in the zoning code that we have absolutely no idea what's going on, and we don't have to. But I think what I'm hoping to do is we could express our intent to our elected officials and our professionals and have them say, we could say, like, these are the goals we're trying to achieve. This is where we're trying to go. And you guys figure out, you know, how to get there, right? It's not your job to do this. It's their job to do this. So I've been trying to, like, what's the analogy about the zoning situation? And Jane's question, um, and I sent Jane the email so she knows, the, the question about, you know, here we are concerned with bigger houses going up in our neighborhood and are they going to destroy the neighborhood character, but we're also concerned with where's the affordability, where are the houses that, you know, regular people could live in, right? Where do the seniors could live when they don't want a big house and they want to downsize somewhere? Or people who can't afford to live in Princeton because the taxes are so high and they want to put an addition in sec who said uh, secondary dwelling units, right? Accessory dwelling units and rent it out so it will help them with the taxes. So I, I've been trying to like formulate an analogy here, trying it on several people. So think about Princeton is a steam train, right? It's beautiful, right? It's very nice. It was built solidly, has awesome qualities, but it's a steam train. And we're riding it into the 21st century. And it's a steam train. Is it as great technologically, environmentally? You know, it's a steam train. Is it fast enough for us to get into the 21st century? And, you know, okay, is it the right thing to be riding into the 21st century? Is it enough room for everybody to be there? Can everybody afford to buy a ticket? There's no way for a person in a wheelchair to get on this train, mm -hmm. right? Like, okay, what do we do? Do we like scrap our steam train and say, ah, you know, in the scrap pile it goes, let's get something completely different and just speed it. No, right? We don't want to do that. We like our steam train. So, but, okay, so what do we do? But I'm thinking like, do we have to have only one train? What if we got another train? Right? And, you know, we didn't all have to go on the same one. Could we, you know, have several ones that run on schedules or something? Right? I mean, I don't know. Help me think about this. How, how do we think about this through? Because otherwise, you know, we're, we're, so I think what happened with the first presentation that Kevin showed, I think the town hired an amazing consultant who did an amazing job thinking, talking to people, looking at neighborhood character, addressing specific concerns, and he did a really good job. And I really think that's a really good starting point, right? And I think what we should do is we should do more of that. We should try to have more conversations about goals. And the next step should be, okay, let's plan for having these accessory dwelling units. Let's plan on having duplexes. I mean, is it really terrible to live on Jefferson in a duplex? I mean, come on. Is it really so awful? Really? And let's acknowledge that, like Kristen said, some homes just have to be demolished. They just do. I mean, they're just like, you know, the question about the house on Green Street, right? The, the one that Max is remodeling. I remodeled the same exact house on Bank Street. It's like twins, right? Those houses were solidly built. 
They're high quality, you can remodel them, you can do stuff with them. But there are others that are just not, right? They're, they were built in a way that, you know, this type of construction is meant to last 50 years. Some of them have been around mm -hmm. for 70 years. And some people take really good care of them, and effectively every little piece has already been replaced. So none of the original is still there, but it's been maintained. And some people just didn't do a thing. And that's okay, right? And now the time has come. It's not slowly replacing every part, but it's like you just have to do it all at the same time, and it looks shocking, right? So I would hope what we talk about is sort of our goals and you know, do we ride the steam train? Do we scrap the steam train? Do we keep the steam train? But, you know, I think the, the ordinance that's coming on Monday is saying, oh, well, no more trains allowed. <laughs> and it's like, oh, okay, great, because the, the, the trains that are coming are going to be bigger and faster and we don't want them. I, you know, let's, let's talk about that. And maybe we don't. But I think what we should start doing is calling it what it is, right? Because when somebody reads in the newspaper, oh, we're going to remove the adjustment to the FAR, and it's going to be great, and it's going to stop teardowns. What do you think? Okay. All right. <clears throat> but when I look at it, and I have clients on Western Way, why did I put the Western Way example we could put up? I have clients who have been working on an addition, Everything's going well, we have it planned out, they're going to add a room to their house, and the attorney calls like, you know what? Got it submitted by Monday. I'm like, I'm not ready. I don't have a civil engineer. And they've just, between last week and Monday, they had to fire, uh, hire a civil engineer and a surveyor, pay like $7,000 just to get the prep work so we could submit. So we could get it done, because we've been planning on an addition on Western Way. Really? Is this where we want this town to be going? We want to place everybody outside of law, right? We, this is how it seems to be going. We want to say that everything with these houses is basically non-conforming. Everybody is outside of the law. So that means then we have to have little provisions. That means that says that, okay, well, this is the best it's ever going to be, right? And anything you do after this, it's basically a problem. We're trying to stop it. We don't want anything else. So, is it? Maybe it is. Maybe this is what we want, but let's have that conversation. Right? I personally think that we have room for improvement. I think we can improve our environmental approaches. I think if we have more room, we, we could add accessory dwelling units, we could add missing middle housing so that people could live in the center of town and walk to work. I, it's a 15 minute work, walk from my house to my office. I am so grateful. I used to live in San Francisco and commute to Berkeley and now we're in the Bay Bridge. I am so grateful, I kid you not, that I could walk in 15 minutes on a snow day leaving my kids at home with a babysitter and be in the office by the <laughs> Just, and, I'm so, and I understand how lucky I am to have that. But I want other people who work in small world downstairs for me to have that opportunity, but they don't. Because there's no place for them to live in this town. I mean, let's have this discussion. Is the steam train only has red velvet seats? And the tickets are super expensive? And this is the only train we've got and no more room? So, I don't know. Is this how we want to think about ourselves? I, I'm sorry, like, this is very emotional for me, but how else do you talk about it? So it, zoning is the way that this is done, but we don't talk about it. So happy to take questions. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, would you like to offer some comments? That's a tough act to follow. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, by all three of you. Um, the takeaway for me is that I think human nature is to try to distill it down to one answer. And, and there isn't one answer. There's not one answer in anything we do. You know, we look at our, uh, our world, our national politics, and there is not one answer. And you take it down to the local level, and there is not one answer. There are several answers, but it's to try to get that consensus. I think the form-based zoning is a very good start. 
because it does expand the parameters of the traditional zoning. I've done some work in Cranberry, and they have a very interesting take on zoning. They have, in essence, very broad parameters, and it's really up to the zoning officer to approve your application. I recently worked on a project. Another architect had expanded the house. Uh, I worked with the client to do a landscape plan and to add an accessory building. And uh, we could have added, we as, in essence added another house. It looks like a barn, it has a garage, it has a great room, has a rec room, the family's large, they have a lot of guests, they have a lot of extended family. Um, but it worked. It worked aesthetically, it worked for the neighborhood. Um, Princeton is a larger community. I can't see that model working here as well. But um, I think the foreign base is a great start. Along with that, historic districts. Historic districts not only preserve the buildings and the history associated with them, but I think they can go to um, maintaining housing types and even bra income bracket levels. You know, some of the older buildings that are smaller are preserved and not expanded, and then that could be lower income or empty nester housing. And, and, and you know, you can't solve everything with, with an ordinance. I mean, uh, Kirsten and uh, Marina were talking about, um, you know, some buildings are not worth keeping, and, and that's true. You know, how, how do you keep um, a house that, um, you know, needs $300,000 worth of Works of work and, and to rebuild it would be 200,000. It's really hard to, you know. What I lament about Princeton is having been here since 1982 is seeing some of the character being diminished and being dumbed down. And um, to that extent, the form based zoning I think will help us. Um, a lot of architecture, and I use that term very broadly, a lot of new building that's been put up is um, developer ish. It is not unique to this town. Uh, it, it doesn't speak to our colonial past. Uh, certainly the town is not all colonial. Certainly it, it has the, the breadth of architectural design and style. But um, I don't think it's gotten better since I've been here. And that's kind of sad. It's really sad. So I think the foreign base will, will speak to that, um, especially in the residential section I, I, sector. I think we've gotten some more interesting architecture downtown in the uh, commercial sector. Um, and I really look forward to uh, seeing if the town comes up with uh, design guidelines for the Wizards of Jackson. I think that's very important. Um, years ago, there was a big discussion in the western section about that becoming a historic district. Uh, there have been a few teardowns, um, a few that I think were worth lamenting, a couple not. So there's a couple new buildings in the western section. Some are okay, some are not so great. Um, I think if you have things spelled out, people know what they have to deal with. My client on Green Street has said several times, I don't know what the Historic Commission has purview over and what they don't have purview over. I'm the Historic Chair of Hopewell Township. So, yeah, it, you're right. And if it's a written document, it's a design guideline, here it is, here's your parameters, here's our guide that we work from. And then there's a discussion. Green Street was full, for us, was full of variances. I think most of them were well-founded. I think the end product, by and large, is a nice end product. It's a big product. Does it take it out of the socioeconomic level of the traditional neighborhood there? It sure does. You know, is that a good thing? Up for debate. Um, so I, I think it's keep working on the zoning. I'd love to see former borough, former township consolidated. We still have R1 in what used to be known as the borough and R1 in what used to be known as the township. You know, ironically, you know, Prince changed his name several times. Um, <laughs> we have zoning that matches that. <laughs> so it'd be nice to really get a consolidated document and, and keep working on it. As you all have said, you know, we are on a steam train, but why can't we have another train? Why can't we have the dinky come back? I mean, we've got a lot of issues. Yeah, that's true. I wish elected officials would work on that issue. 
<laughs> so, uh, so Marina, that steam train's probably run by coal too, right? <laughs> <laughs> You know, I think the largest issue that we face in America today across our country, and we talk a lot about, is the issue of equity and justice and equal application of the laws and equal treatment under the laws to all of us. And in various areas, we don't measure up to our aspirations. And we're always shocked and surprised when, we, when it's exposed by nightly news or a YouTube clip of treatment by uh, people in government um, protection of citizens in ways that don't match up to our understanding of what equal treatment under the law means. You see that a lot in law enforcement, but I want you to realize it applies to zoning and it applies to land use. And to the extent that we create regulations that allow a certain class to do whatever they want and another class to not be able to do what they would like, that creates an imbalance and uneven application of rights. So it might seem extreme to call zoning a social justice, civil rights issue, but I do want you to think about not creating laws that are narrowly targeted at a single band of people in this case, economic people who can only afford a certain size home in Princeton. And these are not applicable to people who can afford two and three acre homes. So that leaves me queasy and ill at ease. Yep. Uh, this has been the condition in the Witherspoon Jackson neighborhood for a century. The application in the mid 60s of what was essentially a suburban zoning ordinance, which requires, for example, that we put all of our parking on our own property, not somewhere else, not in the street, is actually a way to control who lives there and what they do with their property. As if somehow all these cars were going to get together one night when we were asleep and take <laughs> over the town <laughs> the next morning. Right? So, Realize that when you create ordinances that send an inordinate number of people to the Zoning Board of Adjustment, you, you introduce an, an, a fudge factor in application of laws that allows certain people to come out with a certain result. And candidly, all of us know up here that result can be positioned by the quality of information we provide to the Zoning Board, the amount of money we throw at bringing consultants, engineers, planners, application of testimony. Every one of us knows the precise dance of testimony that we have to provide. The language of benefit to a neighborhood, the language of no negative impact, to say everything we need so that that testimony will survive a court challenge for our clients. An average homeowner will not know that. We've learned that by stumbling through it for dozens of years. I'm just, as a real quick aside, I'd like each one of you to throw out a number of what you think professional fees sum to for a land use application in Princeton and I want you in your mind to include your fee, the civil engineer's fee, the planner's fee, the landscape designer's fee, and although we don't know the attorney's fee, and it's more than all of those other four <laughs> somehow together. <laughs> but just take a guess. Max? Priceless. <laughs> well, there you have it. Because, because if you don't get through, then it has no value. If you do get through and it costs, I mean, I would say twenty to thirty thousand dollars. Josh thinks it's higher. It's, it's lately it's been thirty to fifty. I would say. Curse. Yeah. If you can get the right the attorney. Application. Well, right. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, for for simply putting a generator where it's not supposed to be, three thousand at least and then go on up. But that, that is 25% of cost of buying the generator. Mm -hmm. But even on the simplest level, right, the simplest level, let's say you need to go to the historic board to replace your vinyl windows. 
right? Because the initial review was rejected. Now, what you need to do is, if you're going to do it right, you need an architect, you need an attorney, and you know the last couple of those have cost our clients between three and eight thousand dollars just to go through historic. So there's some startling numbers. So you see how again this favors the privileged. And personally, I have a problem with that. Now simultaneously, it's a real struggle for me as somebody who comes at the world from a progressive point of view to realize that there are indeed problems with regulation. And there are indeed regulation issues that are cumbersome, costly, and ineffective. I want to tell you actually the state took some action last year of which I was surprised and privately pleased after I really understood what had happened. But they changed building permit rules for single family residents. So now you do not need a permit to re-roof your house. You used to need a permit if you wanted to re-roof more than 25% of your house. Now you don't. You think just please go re-roof your house. You do not need a permit to re-roof, re-side your house. You used to need a permit to re-side more than 25% in one year of your house. So you think, oh my goodness, all this work is happening now and it's not being inspected. And that's what we all sort of thought. The practical truth was construction departments across New Jersey never went out and enforced the regulations on re-roofing and re-siding and never actually did the inspections. Therefore, the state decided in an effort to reduce regulations, well, let's just get rid of it then. And let's still say the builder is required to meet the code when they re-roof. You can't just slap any old shingle up on eight layers of roofing. You have to meet the code. You are liable as a builder, if you do it incorrectly, to receiving a violation notice. But you don't have to pay the $60 or $150 fee. You don't have to wait three weeks for it to happen. You may proceed. And the assumption is you, the building owner, will hire reputable people to do a good job. And should there be a problem, you can pursue that as a private consumer fraud claim. So actually, I think that makes a lot of sense. There are some things we need to create easier pathway to people succeeding and working on their homes. Some of this also happens with zoning. Now, there was a question earlier that I punted until now about accessory dwelling units. And I thought maybe if we could have the panel engage in a little discussion about their thoughts about it. But I want to throw out one idea. I believe in the old township regulations, if you want to add a unit, you have to provide an additional parking space. So right there, if you need to expand your driveway and a, provide additional parking space, that could be five grand. And there's more asphalt in your front yard. Is that really necessary? It drives the cost up. Why can't that car just park in the driveway like all the other cars you leave? Or maybe clean out one side of your garage, for crying out loud, and actually put a car in there. <laughs> First. Uh, okay. Well, I have a little, a little narrative, I guess, um, on the accessory dwelling unit issue. So uh, on the house next to me, which I owned five years ago and renovated and resold, there were two apartments in that house. And there was a three-car garage in the back of that house. And I thought, you know what would be great is if I could uh, keep the two-family nests of it um, and make the back garage a studio apartment, rentable, ideally by whoever purchased the property, and renovate the front house into, back into its original single-family house. And I had an application already for the zoning board uh, because I don't have to pay an architect or planner and all those other people. So I was able to slog through that on my own. And then I uh, had a meeting with the town lawyer who said, there's no way that we're going to let you do this. I said, really? Because here's the thing. I'm not adding parking. I'm not increasing the envelope of the building. I'm not adding a dwelling unit. I'm not adding anything. The only difference is I'm taking the two apartments from the front and I'm separating them by a piece of grass. Uh, you know, it, it's not 
two separately purchasable properties. It's just plain rentable for somebody, which means that they could use it for an elderly parent. They could use it for a kid who's come back from college. They could rent it out for a little extra income. And they said, absolutely not, because they're two separate structures. And I thought, you know, <laughs> okay, so I'm taking away a dwelling unit is what I'm doing in the town. And this is not the first time that I have done this. And it's not because I like taking dwelling units away. Uh, it's because that's what the zoning says we need to do. Um, additionally, when I built a house on Valley Road last year, people asked me, well, what are you building? I said, well, I'm building a single family house. I can't build anything else. I'm not allowed to build a duplex. I can't build three apartments. Um, even though there's a huge demand for, as we all know, houses that are less than a million dollars, houses that are a little smaller, houses that maybe are on a single floor. So, you know, you stack two apartments on top of each other. All of that would require zoning grades. I spoke to a couple land use attorneys about it and said, you know, why don't I do this? Why don't I apply for it? I'm willing to be, you know, a, a pioneer. Let's see if we could get a duplex. And I had an attorney who I respect a lot, who's been in front of the town a lot, say, you don't have a snowball's chance in hell of getting that through. It has to be single family. And I said, all right, uncle, single family it is. But the drive of the zoning is big single family houses. So how in the world are we supposed to accomplish affordable housing when that's all we're allowed to build? Uh, Kevin, can I just say something? Um, Princeton Future is sort of an effort at what Bob Gettys called participatory democracy. And in I think that this is a spirit, plug. This is a plug, but it's also in response uh, to Kirsten's comments. I would like to have a show of hands on how many people in this room believe in the idea that. Kirsten should have been allowed to build that accessory unit. Sure. Right? Okay, I did this once in 2007 about consolidation, and the hands in the room shocked a lot of people. And I think accessory units are something this town ought to get behind. Back to you. And thank you, Kirsten, really. Well, I, well this one's louder. Um, I also think that a lot of people are just doing it anyway, you know, and I think that. Um, there are a large number of people who, you know, they rent out that third bedroom and, uh, or they rent out their basement and they do it in town, even though they're supposed to get a permit, even though they're supposed to be doing all that other stuff. And more often than not, those people who are living in those homes are, are adding to the, um, really the great character of our community because they're walking into town, they're working in town, and that's where they can afford to live. And, I think those homeowners are sort of circumventing the uh, the approval process and all the other issues, um, but I think it's indicative of of the issue and the challenge. And certainly, you know, that type of uh, residence and that type of um, use should be permitted in a lot of our, our neighborhoods where the zoning doesn't permit it. Um, it was mentioned before, you know, why can't we just park in the front yard? And uh, I have a friend of mine on Madison um, Street here in town who, um, you know, submitted a variance so that, that they could actually park in the front of their house, in the driveway that existed. Or actually, I shouldn't say that, the driveway didn't exist, <laughs> but they wanted to have a driveway. The width of their house wasn't wide enough, so they were parking in front of their house. And it was, I mean, I suppose I shouldn't be shocked, but I was shocked that all the neighbors came out against her parking in front of her house. And she had enough to pull the car completely off of the, off of the road. She didn't want to park in the street anymore. And, uh, but the neighbors came out against it. And the neighbors came out against it at the same time. They all parked, even though they had deeper driveways and could have parked in their garage, which are filled with who knows what. <laughs> and they could have pulled up to the side of their house. But no, they parked in the front of their yards. Can I just make a quick comment? She actually could not park on the street because it's permit parking. And she worked out of town, and when she would come home at night, she sometimes couldn't find a parking place near her house, and she had to walk 
a few blocks away in the dark back to her house. Absolutely. So that. That's a no. Absolutely. My my issue wasn't with her spot. My, I mean, I right. thought no, that I mean, it was a good... It was a very much of a hardship for her to even park near her home. Yeah. And, and, and I think that one of the challenges we have in our community is we're not neighborly enough, mm -hmm. I think, and we don't recognize other people's hardships. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a perceived hardship for one person may not be for the other person, but that doesn't mean that um, we can't be neighborly. And I think that, um, you know, to a certain extent, zoning um, actually has the ability to level the playing field if it's set up properly. And, um, and I think that right now, that is, you know, we don't have a level playing field even between neighbors, you know, and definitely not when you have these current uh, overlays in the, over the community that span completely disparate neighborhoods. Thank you for that, Josh. Um, realize that the negative consequence of illegal, unapproved housing units inside existing buildings that they won't comply with code requirements that would be required for that bedroom. So every one of us has gone to a, a job where someone has said to us, well, we're going to put a bedroom down here in the basement. And we tell them, well, that's fine, but you need to have a window of a certain side that provides egress out that bedroom should there be a fire or a problem. So to the extent that someone does an illegal conversion of a basement for bad bedrooms, they will not comply with that requirement. It's not the hardest requirement in the world to comply with. You cut open a wall, you dig a window, well, you put the window in for crying out loud. And it allows safety, protection of life, health, safety, and welfare. So the, the, over, the over application of harsh regulation drives people away from compliance. Marina. Um, wow, this microphone's amazing. Um, so I would like to make um, three points and um, sort of centering on Valerie's point about the new um, decision that just came out about the type of owners. So first of all, um, other towns in this country are moving away from uh, or moving away from single family zoning and basically saying, I think it was Minneapolis that just came up with new zoning regulations say there are no more single family zones. Basically, that's it in Minneapolis. And I'm thinking like, wow, you can think about it as sort of very radical, but on the other hand is, is that so radical? It's going back to, you know, how bad is it that duplex on Jefferson or more, right? So that's sort of what, where the world is going to. The second point is, just so everybody knows, everybody in the township is allowed to have a secondary dwelling unit in their home as of right now. If you'd like one, if you could provide enough parking and do all of these things, it is totally legal they allowed. So why aren't people doing it, right? First of all, people probably don't know about it. And also the parking situation and all of these additional requirements. So if we were to, we didn't have to say any, no need to change big swooping changes. Just say, just say there's no parking minimum it's sort of a suggested parking, right? And should you would like to have an apartment that you're going to rent for more money because it will have a parking space? Okay, absolutely. But if you would like to have a cheaper one for a person without a car who will bike or walk or whatever, sure, but you won't be able to charge as much and the economics will work itself out. So let's say people start doing that and now we have a street in Riverside where people have graduate students living in the back of their house or they're, you know, everybody says, oh, it's a Granny Smith and we're gonna have family members, but what's so bad about unrelated people living there? I mean, so this gets back to the decision that just came out that Valerie talked about, is that why are we discriminating based on who lives there, right? And is it because that these people can't afford a home? Now they're not allowed to live in this town? Seriously, or how bad would it be if both of those people were owners? Just think about it. Is that, you know, we have tons of split level houses in this town, right? So just think about it. You know, the split level house, there's a wall and half of it is on half a level off. What if you just suspend your disbelief and divide it by the dividing wall, right? So one side would be one unit, and the other side's going to be another unit. And one will have one family, and the other one will have another family. 
and they will own it together as a condo. Will Princeton come to an end? <laughs> I mean, seriously, let's talk about this, because when we try to suggest it to our former planning officer, I would come and say, Lee, could we have a duplex? He's like, who would want to live next to a duplex? Right? Did you guys have that conversation? Yeah. It's like, no, nobody. I mean, like, let's do, like, is everybody going to be terribly offended? If like the split level was split and one half was one family and another part was another family. Okay, end of the world. But I think it all backs into, but there are going to be extra children in the school. Da -da -da -da. Let's say it. Right? So let's talk about it. This is important. Is it so terrible? Is it okay? I mean, but what if we don't talk about it? So the third point I would like to make, Let's have other people write letters to the editor. <laughs> Not just me. Come on. That other people would say, no, we're not going to be offended with duplexes, and we're not going to be offended with secondary dwelling units. The, the town just hired a brand new planner. I haven't met the new planner. Have you guys met the yeah, new planner? Is he good? Oh, good one. What's his name? <laughs> Michael said, no, awesome. My, right, so literally just brand new planner, just hired, right? So. If, I, I, I mean, like, sometimes we feel really strangely because we feel that we're working for our staff. Do you guys have that feeling? <laughs> like, I feel, as residents, they're our employees. We're being them. They're working for us. So can we please tell them what we want? So and the people who are asking for the second, dwell, second what do they call it, accessory dwelling units, please, write to council, please come to the council meeting, please write even on any social media that because our council people actually do read it and they will say, oh, okay, it's actually, it's, it's not that scary, everybody is actually on board, everybody really wants this. I mean, maybe we're just a pre-selected group of people here today, right? You know, maybe that's why we're here, but maybe not. So those kind of the points I would like to make that Let's just think about these alternatives. Like Max was saying, there's not one solution. There's got to be multiple solutions. And when we just universally place everybody outside the law, and everybody has to come and ask pretty please with the king of you know, zoning, please allow me an extra bedroom? Really? I mean, let's, let's all think about it that way. So I'm going to throw another angle here, uh, because I don't live in Princeton, I live in Hopewell Township, in the beautiful town of Melrose. Um, I grew up in Somerset County, I grew up in rural suburbia, Warren Township, uh, grew up on two acres. So when I bought my house, it was in a little hamlet, and I'm like, good, I want to be next to neighbors, because I grew up in suburbia, I want to know what it's like having neighbors. A lot of this is based on human nature. You know, in a perfect world, we're all going to get along and we're all going to be like thinking or like enough thinking that we respect our property, we respect the rights of our neighbors, we're going to try to get along. And I think zoning really came about because people don't always get along. People do not always respect their neighbors. I was seven feet away from my neighbor. He burned his wood-burning stove. We elected the Pope at least a hundred times <laughs> with blue smoke coming out of his wood-burning stove. And he was burning oak furniture with varnish on it. Um, it got to the point that at one point a neighbor moved their house back and the two wives talked and said, do you think Max would pay to move us back? And I'm like, yeah, Max will pay to move you back because I'm tired of electing the Pope. And I, you know, in Mount Rose, we didn't have a pope, we only had a cardinal. Um, so I paid to move him back off the corner, and I got the corner piece. The day his house was being moved, he decides to put a fire in his wood-burning stove with a 150-year-old masonry chimney that might be moved a little bit while the house is moving. I called up his wife and said, Debbie, you're going to be the only house that burned down while it was being moved. She said, I will tell my husband to put the fire out. And eventually the house got moved. Um, 
and, and the reason I say this is because you cannot control your neighbors. You, know, you can try to be a good neighbor, you can try to reach out to them. He had tenants that were living there. Um, I had to be a good Christian and I would give one of the guys who was almost homeless, he'd call and say, I want a ride. When I was working at Michael Gray's, he would call um, Mary Harris, our receptionist, and berate her if he couldn't get on the phone with her right away. And, and this is an extreme case, but I want to caution you that, you know, yes, it's nice to provide accessory uses, um, but I don't think, you, you have to go approach it with your, your eyes wide open. In the news recently in Linden, New Jersey, there was a cul-de-sac of split-level houses, single family, and Lenny Dykstra bought a house and improved it and had all types of rumors coming in and out of it. And the neighbors were up in arms. You know, so it begs the question, who has more rights, Lenny Dykstra or the people living in that neighborhood? So does it become a conversation that maybe it's a neighborhood conversation? We have so many different neighborhoods in Princeton. You know, hey, you know, Witherspoon Jackson, do we want to allow the accessory use? You know, and does it become, you know, we are in a democratic nation. You know, is it the majority approves and take it a neighborhood by neighborhood basis? Because there's some neighborhoods that probably don't want that ability. Thank you, Max. All right, we have uh, 12 minutes left, and I know you're anxious to run out, but I, we wanted to take questions from the audience for our panelists. Yes, ma'am. Well, can somebody explain why we, can, we can't park at night in the middle of town, on the street? It's yes. inexplicable, candidly. I've heard various reasons. Uh, Marv could probably give us a 30-minute uh, soliloquy on the various reasons of it for. Um, the one that maybe is plausible, back in the day, the borough didn't want university students parking their cars in town randomly at night. Uh, the university now doesn't allow freshmen and sophomores to have cars on campus, but it really is inexplicable. It's not street cleaning, because back in the day, I It's stranger it. danger. I think people people were concerned yes, about, about the unidentified car in in town. I mean, clearly it's a control device. To what end? I can't exactly tell you. Yes, sir. Hello. Excuse me. Um, my question, very simply, is for each of you on the panel, and perhaps Kevin, uh, should the council pass the law that's being considered on Monday? No. 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 Absolutely not. No. Will you all go and speak tomorrow night? And not yes. tomorrow night, Joe, but we'll go Monday night. <laughs> <laughs> Next question, please. Ingrid. First of all, just a comment about accessory units. I'm uh, innocent about this, but I thought more accessory units existed in the western section than anywhere else because that's where graduate students lived over a park garage and garages and so on. So if it's good enough for them. <laughs> uh, I, I, my question is, you, today mixed use is something that everyone talks about. And um, you, you've talked about residential zoning and now form-based. Is there a need to address what we used to call business districts or commercial districts to think about a more modern way of living uh, with an excuse, and uh, maybe that's a yes or no question, but then should we ask the town to address that as well? I think that's incredibly looking forward to the absolute right point. We talk a lot about residential, and one thing that would just be magical, but it's really, you know, I'm going to come out and say it, if we just eliminate our parking minimums, it will be magical. And there, the, we have a parking study that came out and hired a parking consultant who said that you can introduce a payment in lieu of parking. So if businesses are not able to provide parking on the property, they have to pay to a fund, and the town as a collective will collect all this money and deal with the parking. This will free up so many things that are stuck that it's going to be incredible. 
Well, I think mixed use, the town is sorely short of mixed use. Certainly um, what happened with Avalon Bay and the, the poorly worded zoning, I mean, that's a great example of poorly worded zoning. You know, uh, everyone involved in that original process thought that that zoning read that it was required to have mixed use on that property. And uh, because they didn't say it's required, you could have these multiple uses, but that, not that you needed at least two of them or three of them. Um, that's how Avalon Bay came to be, you know, solely residential. And I think that um, the town has a lot of opportunities to improve the diversity of our community and create certainly affordable housing. Um, but I think that the notion of mixed use in an area, say along Witherspoon Street, the entire length of Witherspoon Street, uh, would certainly, um, you know, be beneficial for our overall community. And I know that there are fears that we're coming becoming too much like a city, um, but I don't think that whether or not we rezone Witherspoon Street to be and allow for uh, mixed use development um, is going to prevent that. So. Thank you. Sir. Yes, sir. In the back. Maybe wait till the fire truck passes. Closer. Closer. Is this better? Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, well, my name's George Stein. I live on the road. And the question goes to something that uh, that Maureen said about the ability to have a second unit in a single family zone under the flat ordinance, I believe. And as I understand it, that currently means it has to be a rental unit that you can't essentially sell it as a small condo the way ownership can be done on, on Jefferson. Is, what's the status of any plans to make it separate ownership possible for these two units in single family zones, which would then not be single family? So George, George wants to know what's the possibility of uh, to condominiumized uh, cooperative owners on a single family lot? Well, I think uh, we don't know the answer to that yet, but I think it goes back to what Valerie explained about the new lawsuit that just came out, explaining that you can't discriminate against who lives in a, in a building, whether they're renting or they're owning. And we don't know how that will play out, and Valerie may be able to answer that better because she's an attorney and we're not, but it leads to the point where I think our municipality will be forced with the choice that I think is gonna come out out of this lawsuit that all of these restrictions that those people have to be rented, renters are no longer legal effectively. This is what that lawsuit said. You can't put that in the document. So then our town will be forced with the choice either scrap the flat ordinance and say, oh, okay, forget it, nobody's allowed to have flats, or, okay, we are allowed to have flats, and then you can rent them both, sell them both, because you can't control the ownership, right? And that will be a discussion that we all need to have, and it goes back to the question, well, you know, maybe I don't want two renters because they're gonna be burning their furniture in there. But I think the issue is, and again, I read the decision that Valerie sent, they said that this is very discriminatory because some owners are really terrible and some renters are really wonderful and you don't know and you really can't discriminate based on that. But I think we're gonna, this is gonna come up right away and we all have to think about how we're gonna move forward and how do we lobby our elected officials. So let's say you know a senior in Riverside has a house and the, the taxes are outrageous and they need to get some money and they're forced to either sell their house and move away or subdivide their house, the flat separately and sell it and have money to retire in their own home. Well, let's think about that. And yeah. candidly, oh, could you, for elected could officials, tell us about that lawsuit because I wasn't aware. The easiest thing for them to do would be just to delete the ordinance and there'll be general grumbling, there'll be no courage there, but they will feel that they will avoid contention. The difficult, hard work thing, but appropriate thing to do, is to rebuild the ordinance, to make it work, and there'll be a lot of difficult conversations to go through, and there'll be contention and disagreement. It is the absolute requirement of your elected officials to navigate that and take you successfully to a conclusion that resolves the majority of issues to the best interest of the most people. 
Um, let me just add something to that. Which is, um, the issue of whether or not you can condominiumize and then separately sell two dwelling units uh, is not just about flats, but also what uh, the density is that's allowed on a lot and whether or not there are uh, two family or multi family uh, dwelling units allowed on a lot. And the uh, lot size minimums for those are generally much bigger than the lots are in any neighborhood that even allows those things. So I think to Kevin's point, this is, um, it would be a, a real overhaul of the zoning code that would be required to, to begin to get at getting more density. And I know that's uh, kind of an ugly word that for some people, but I really think that more density is the only way that we get more affordability. It's more sustainable. It is also more sustainable. Yeah. Yes. A quick a quick quiz. Uh, the topic of the Jefferson two-family homes has come up. May I see a show of hands? How many people believe those homes are approved in our present zoning on Jefferson? You mean the ones that are... The, the ones that are in existence today. Can you build a new two-family on Jefferson? Oh, you're, you're, you're on top of your game, everybody. <laughs> Yes, in the back. Oh, right here in the front. Yeah. I have a, uh, hello, I, Galina Peterson. I have a parking question. There are a lot of uh, residences in town uh, that have either no parking whatsoever. Would you mind taking the mic? Yes. Thank you. Hi, Galina Peterson, and I have a question about parking. Um, there are a lot of residences in town in the old borough that have either no parking or not adequate parking. And we know of at least um, a couple of examples in the uh, vicinity there of from Dimington Madison, that, um, and the one was, someone was mentioning about your friend putting a parking in the front. <coughs> that's one way of, <coughs> excuse me, that's one way of handling it. Um, a lot of neighbors, including us, didn't like that because um, it changes in effect, uh, it, it uh, legalizes the change of the neighborhood. The neighbors might park and leave their houses in their driveways in the front, but at least they have, the, it, it's not a throughout occurrence, right? So putting a driveway that it's short and it's in the front of a house, it changes the neighborhood. Some people feel strongly about that. I don't, but some people do. My husband does feel strongly about that. <laughs> so one way is to handle it that way, because people have cars now. The other way is um, not allowing anything. The town charges different tax for properties that have parking and properties that don't have parking. How plausible is the idea that a homeowner who has no parking or not adequate parking can, for a fee that maybe goes with a deed or maybe is renewed on an annual basis, they can purchase the right from the town to park in front of their house and it's a place that it's designated for them rather than uh, putting a parking parking driveway on their property. There is a, an example of a house in Van Diemen that just got a variance for that. There is another one in Jefferson that a builder is a, a duplex that is remodeled. He got a variance putting a, a parking in the front. Rather than doing that, why don't we allow people to buy the right to to rent a space on the street that is legitimately theirs and it's not an overnight parking which people when they come from work, there is no place to park even though you have a permit. It's a place that is designated for you for a sizable fee that is perhaps correspondent to what you would have been paying in taxes if, if you had parking. So from my, from my understanding that one of the biggest challenges um, is actually not the reasonableness of being able to park in front of your house. I mean, I live on Moore Street. Um, you know. I have issues with parking in front of my house. I've gotten more tickets from parking in front of my house than you can imagine. But um, it, it's actually, when we do have snow and clearances, um, the intent is to allow the municipality to maintain the streets, clean the streets, and all that. That's, you know, the intent. I don't have, I mean, I think it's a perfectly reasonable idea, but there are um, issues that would need to be resolved if you did sort of, uh, you know, uh, permit that kind of parking. Sure, and also right. the width of some of our streets isn't necessarily wide enough. So um, you have an issue where 
on a very narrow street, if, if everybody parks in front of their house in the street, then there's not enough space for the traffic to pass. And so um, there's, it's an interesting idea, but there's lots of logistics that would be involved in that sort of approval. I think some of the houses that don't have parking are in close to the borrow, and actually there is a parking spaces paid parking spaces in front of those homes. So the question of the narrowness of the streets perhaps applies to Bank Street, but it does not apply to most of those homes. Um, also, clearing snow, absolutely. Even now, if you have a permit to park, you have to park in a lot if there is snow, but those are a few days a year. So thank you very much. Uh, it, it certainly could be done. Again, it requires some hard work. So in the spirit of wait, wait, don't tell me, which we missed this morning, I want to ask my panelists in the closing comments, I'd like each one of us to tell us what the next ordinance council will pass relating to zoning should be. Before the panel does that, I'd really like to just make a very quick comment. I'm sorry to interrupt. Oh, oh sure, I missed you over there. My, my, name, is, was my name is Chris Vistinich. I'm one of the few 20-something professionals in this room. And it's the truth. And despite living comfortably in a rental right now, my wife and I would never dream of buying a house in Princeton. It is completely unaffordable in virtually every single part of the town. Uh, consequently, it's, it's really frustrating to me that for being such a quote-unquote progressive town, that we still balk and shy away and talk around words like density and housing, because unless there's any kind of overhaul in the density of housing, I will always be priced out, and people like me will continue to leave the town and not be attracted to the town. So I just wanted to make this observation that um, I wish that this prevalence of nimbyism, that's really the largest impediment to real housing reform in this town, could really be something that everyone could take a look at themselves and realize that middle income and young professionals are being priced out at an alarming rate. Thank you. Thank you very much. What's your name again? Chris. 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 Thank you very much, Chris. I do want to point out in the room today are two members of our zoning board, two members of our planning board, and two candidates who are running for elected office. So I hope they're all listening to you because it's very, very important. So thank you, Chris. My colleagues. Amen to that. Thank you. <laughs> um, I don't. I can't name a specific ordinance because I haven't given. Well, no, I want you to make one up. This is <laughs> I can't make something up on the spot, but I would say that it should be something that allows more duplexes and multifamily dwelling. Cool. Homes. Thank you. I'll be optimistic, and um, I even I know that uh, there are some affordable housing proposals that the town is working on, and even that affordable housing proposal. Um, on Franklin Street that they're working on uh, doesn't meet current zoning because of the density. So I will be optimistic and say that they will provide for increased density along with the Spoon Street uh, that would allow for these type of projects to happen. And thank you so much for speaking, Chris, because um, Kristen and I were sitting in front at the beginning, and I was saying there's only one person in this room who's younger than me, those who are there say. <laughs> and I'm not that young. And then a couple more people showed up. I'm so grateful. Thank you. And I was like, oh, okay, thank you. But please, density and mixed use is what we desperately need. Ingrid uh, touched on this with her question of mixed use. And in our post-Amazon apocalypse, I think uh, it won't necessarily be an ordinance, but a big topic of discussion is affordable retail spaces and yes. service spaces in the town, because that has become a very large issue, and it's affected not just Princeton, but all over. And Amazon truly is uh, the one to credit for that. And, how easy it is for us to get something delivered to our mailbox versus going and shopping and making contact with someone. So that's a, a big topic for downtown to address. Well, there you have it. Thank you very much, Max. Thank you very much, Marina. Thank you very much, Josh. Kirsten, thank you very, very much, all four of you, for giving your time today. For Judd and Marty, who were here earlier, and the rest of us from Princeton Future, we thank you for coming out this morning, and we urge you to go out and be active and committed in the same way Princeton is for social justice to land use justice.
Good morning.